Thank you, Wills. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome. Um, yeah, thank you, Lynn. <laughs> so, um, yeah, my, my prayer for us this morning, uh, yeah, I want to do a good job. Peter's gone. He's helping Becky move. He's Washington, D.C. with Susan. So we ask the Lord's blessing on their trip. Um, but I want, us, I want us to hear from the Lord. When we started doing sacred space, I, my first thought was, what if, God, what if people don't hear from you? This is going to be really, really awkward because <laughs> we have a lot of time to set aside for hearing from the Lord. And I want for us this morning, I want to, I want to take that risk of, uh, of not having drafted out my entire message, um, but prepared well, but in a different way. And I want to lean into that this morning, and I, I want you to come on that journey with me as we, as we look, not so much for a new truth uh, to think about how to engage with God, but, but more a posture of the heart. Um, we've all gone through really difficult things in life. And go ahead and throw that first slide up there. Um, because I didn't write it out, there's not Q, so yeah. So this is God at the computer. Uh, this is by uh, Gary Larson. Gary Larson, is that right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's a man walking under a piano and God's finger is poised over the smite button. And uh, yeah, I think we're good. Um, so when disaster falls, right, the big question we always have is, well, Lord, is this from you? Is this your discipline? Is this from the devil seeking to kill, steal, and to destroy? Is just this the way of the world and its corrupt systems and I'm getting caught in the gears? Or, or is my hardship I'm going through my own foolishness or my own flesh getting in the way? My pride, my ambition, my irresponsibility, whatever that is. So, so when that disaster happens, it's like, I want to know why, because I want to know how to respond, how to fix it. You know, do I, do I say, do I just submit to it? Lord, well, Lord, your will be done, not mine, but yours. Or do I battle against the devil saying, I rebuke you. I rebuke this whole situation and call down fire on it. Or do I come over here and say, well, that's, that's the world. So I, do, I, do I try to straighten the world out? Do I, do I look at compromising with the world or I double down and stand firm against the world. Or I look at my own self and saying, why, what have I done? What part of this is my fault, you know? Or what part of this is somebody else's fault? What did they do wrong? And so I'm kind of judging by circumstances. Well, if the circumstances are good, then obviously I must be pleasing God. I must be walking in a way that he wants to bless me. And if bad things happen, then, oh, I, I must have, somebody screwed up somewhere and God's hitting the smite button or... Or he's not paying attention, he's allowing the devil to run a little too free, uh, like with Job, you know, kind of felt, you know, gave him a little too, too much free hand, too much leeway there, Lord. Or, or is this just a wake-up call in my life, you know? Is God saying, you need to be more responsible. You need to quit burning the candle at both ends. So, or you need to learn to confront healthily and not just ignore problems, hoping they'll go away. So there's this whole thing of the sense of discipline. It's like, well, what do I do with this bad stuff that happens? Um, how do I get it to stop? And, and are these even the most helpful questions? Kind of like a whose fault is it? If I know whose fault it is, then I know how to pray, right? I can, I can become the magician to pray the name of Jesus and say the right prayers that God wants to hear. Maybe it's a confession. Maybe it's a proclamation. Maybe it's a faith statement. I don't know whatever my religious system says. This is how we work God to make the situation better. And so the false self is always looking for how can I regain control of this situation? And the false self works into our religious self. How can I work God for, to take control of this situation? But I'm really surrendering control to God. But we all know it's, yeah, but I, I'm kind of my will be done. And I'm going to cloak it as your will be done. So that's, that's the... The, so uh, maybe in terms of the most helpful questions, what really <sighs> underlying how we discern, is this God, this the devil, this the world, is this myself, is sort of our big view. So in that situation that we're trying to have discernment, the big view of what is the kingdom of God all about, what is creation all about, will determine our view of God in the particular loss, Right? For, 
my wife, Kathy, it was the loss of her husband, Lynn, at 55, right? 50, yep, 50, out on, a, out on a run, and he died of a massive heart attack, you know. Well, where's that promise that the Lord will lengthen the, the days of the righteous? And we have a number of people, especially in our sacred space, who've been widowed, uh, and they've suffered that loss of a spouse. With people going through cancer, you know, when I went through cancer, it's like, whoa, what, what was that? Was that the world? Was that the, 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 the lab I used to work at where I was breathing in fumes of um, aerosols, <laughs> of petrochemicals and, and isopropyl alcohol? Did that, those are carcinogens. Did that contribute to it? Was that because I was in seminary burning the candle at both ends and ignoring the sleep I needed? Was it because I had gone through divorce and that stress was now catching up to me? Is it, the, is it the roundup in our diet? You know, what's, what are all these contributing factors? I want to know, Lord, what, and why now? You know, why when I was six years, my sixth year of seminary working full time, did I get married for six months? Did I get hit with cancer again? You know, I want to know, Lord, are you, are you smiting me? Are you paying attention? Uh, you didn't seem to be paying attention when my first divorce came out. You kind of dropped the ball on that. So here I am trusting you again. Are we paying better attention this time, Lord? Or, or is there some secret sin I need, to, I need to find out, you know, that I haven't dealt with yet? So we can get into this quagmire of, uh, Lord, what are you doing? And how do I get in line with you and your program? And is this a wake-up call? And is it a wake-up call from you? Or is this, well, you know, what's just, what the hell's going on? You know, how do, how do, I, get with, how do I get with what you're doing? Um, so this will be what our view of God is. So what is our purpose for life on earth, right? Is it a pass-fail test? Is this, is this all of life just like, is this just a term? Well, if you were to die today, where would you spend eternity? Is that what this life is about? Is it a pass-fail test? Um, escaping God's judgment? That God's either weighing our good works and bad works? If, you know... Or, or for good Protestants, then God's, God's saying, no, it's about making the, the right belief, believing the right things, making the right confessions, and then you can escape God's judgment. Or is, it, or is it not even about escaping judgment? Is God's judgment actually good in something that's for our good, right? As Peter says, God viol- God's good will violates our bad will so that we can have good free will. Um. Is this a training ground? Is this all of life a training ground, right? So we read in the parable of talents. Well, you've been faithful with a few talents. Now, you're, now you'll be faithful over many, many cities. Is God preparing us in this life for the life to come and the actual authority that he wants us to carry on as co-heirs with Christ? Is, is that what this life is about? Is it a maturing journey that God's given us the tools to keep growing steadily, you know, gradual improvement, and then someday we'll reach perfection. Is that what it's about? Or is it a transformational journey of God traveling with us? That he's, he's not just going to steady growth. He's gonna, we're going to have moments of transcendent growth where we, we sort of just step into a whole new life. Uh, we see this with children, like when they learn to read. You know, you'll a five-year-old go, comes home from school, and their world just suddenly just blossoms beyond what you saw with them as their parents when their world was just you. And now there's this whole new world that they're exploring and learning, and it's, it's very fascinating to watch. But we have these moments of transcendence throughout our, our life. We just don't recognize them because they're so ordinary. You know, moving from school into career, moving from um, singlehood to having real serious responsibility where people are really dependent on you whether that's as a, as a spouse or a parent or in your, in your job. Maybe you're an engineer designing bridges, and it's like, if I don't do this right, people are going to die. Or I'm a doctor, Tom, you know, um, that their, their life is in my hands. I need to do this well. And, and there's something about those challenges that cause us to just, just lift us up to a whole other level. Um, is it about deification? And this comes out of more of the, the Eastern Orthodox view of the sense of theosis, that, that God became man, Jesus becomes man, and that he can lift us up with him to be co-heirs with Christ, the firstborn of many brothers. And how does a God responsibly do that? Uh, I'm thinking like in, in, 
Can he trust us with that much power, right? That, that we would actually have the character that God is actually doing a good thing by trusting us to be co-heirs with Christ and not just subjecting all of creation to deeper futility. We, you know, when, when we sort of rise above our level of competence, uh, bad things happen, and you know, a good God wouldn't do that. So, but he wants to give us that authority. So how does he grow us into it? So those are, those are kind of what is, what is the big story I'm not going to answer that this morning, but these are just things I want you to think about when I'm trying to just figure out what's happening in the moment is what's the big picture that I placed God in? What is my big picture saying about God? What is my big picture saying about me and how God and I relate and how God and other people relate? So um, as we move into a different story, Brene Brown has this wonderful thing of saying, the story I'm telling myself is, so when you're having conflict with your spouse, right, and they say something, you're like, oh, she's mad at me. Not only is she mad at me, but maybe she's been mad at me for a long time. Maybe, maybe, maybe she's like fed up with me. All right, we just, we just spin this story out of control. So her thing is you go to the spouse, say, you know, Kathy, I, the story I'm telling myself is, you know, uh, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't change, I didn't buy that new printer we needed to, and now I keep trying to fix the old one, and uh, yeah, and now I'm just, yeah, I need, to, I need to just learn to spend the money on the things that need fixing instead of trying to keep cobbling stuff together, right? So, sorry, I'm frustrating you, and I wasn't able to print my sermon last night because my printer wasn't working, so yeah, so that's fun. Um, I mean, I have it now, but yeah. Uh, we're good. <laughs> so, when we approach the scripture, what we want to say, in, well, when hardship comes my way, recognize the story I'm telling myself about God is, and what is that? Is God a judge? Is God smiting me? Is God not paying attention? Has God dropped the ball? Is, is God, is he just a perfectionist, kind of this holy prude Pharisee? And I've offended him somehow, and so I'm going to, you know, what is God just wanting to mature me? Is he wanting to walk alongside me? Is he wanting to grow me up? Is he, is he enjoying the process of raising me and, and helping me move from immaturity into maturity? Or is, you know, what's, what's the look on his face in this situation? Is it one of compassion? Is it one of love? Maybe, maybe he kind of is laughing with me. Um, I had, a, I had a moment when I was hiking once, uh, and I had, I had said, Lord, I tried it your way. We're going to try it my way now, because your way didn't work. So I'm not sure I understand what your way is. So I did that. That, that uh, was about three months into that, and it's like I was falling back into the same old pattern. And uh, I, was just, I, was, I was walking up... Um, not Deer Creek, that's my current hike. Anyway, Falcon Park, walking up there, Turkey Trot Trail, and I was coming down, and I just said, Lord, I can't believe I'm back in this situation. And I'm looking down, and the Lord said, John, look at me. And I said, no. And he said, look at me. And the Lord said, take, <laughs> take your hands and push your chin up. And so I'm doing this, my chin's going down, and my hands are pushing up. And he says, look at me. I love you. I'm with you. That, that was, that, it wasn't a rebuke. It was an encouragement. It was a discipline of the Lord saying, yeah, you're screwing up right now. And, and you need my gentle touch. You need my healing touch. This isn't, this isn't a time for a heavy hand. Um, there, was, there was a time when I was, right after my first wife had left, before the divorce had gone through, I was in the empty house, and I was sitting on my son's bed. And it's like, God, where are you? How did this happen? And the Lord says, John, now you know how I feel. You've done this to me. You've withdrawn your love. And it wasn't an accusation. It wasn't a 
well, how's it, how's shoes on the other foot now? It's like, John, I know this pain. I know this pain. I know this because you've, you've done it to me. Uh, let's weep together. Uh, the, Lord, the Lord's discipline reveals what is truly valuable in our heart. Because oftentimes we deceive ourselves. The false self deceives us. The world's deceiving us. The devil's deceiving us. Our righteous religious self is deceiving us. And God's revealing what's really, what's really in our heart. Wow. He shows us what, are, what we're truly longing for. And in loss, we find what we're truly longing for. Catherine. Um, and we cherish what we had. And we have that hope, right, carrying forward that the Lord will, whatever that restoration looks like, it's taking, it's, it's, excavated a deeper level in our spirit where we commune with God. And we, sh- we can't shrink back to who we were before the loss, as, as painful as that loss was. The growth, uh, as Paul would say, the, the glory that is to be revealed can't compare to the current trials and tribulations and sufferings. <sighs> so what is, so that, how our view of God when trial comes will reveal what our big story is. And maybe that, maybe that needs some correcting, right? Our view of God is too small. I've made you too small for my eyes. Lord, forgive me. It's not a forgive me like I'm going to get you. It's like, Lord, come and heal. Come and expose where I've made you too small. That needs healing. I, I need that to grow, Scott. Because it's... it's <sighs> It's hampering my worship. It's hampering my fellowship with the Lord when I make him too small. So the, the tribulation also reveals what the false self is doing. The false self are these programs for happiness that we have. We've learned probably since emerging from the womb of what I need to be happy, what I need for survival and security, esteem and affection, power and control. These are legitimate needs of the natural man legitimate good needs of the natural man. The false self sort of takes the way the body works and tries to apply that to higher levels of consciousness. So it tries to apply it to our rationality. You know, I need air to breathe. If you cover my head with a plastic bag, I'm going to do everything I can to rip it off. My body's going to take over. If you try to rescue someone's drowning as a lifeguard, you know this. They will drown you because they're not thinking rationally. Their body just takes over. The body knows this is what I need and I need it now. The danger in the spiritual realm and in the social realm in relationship is when my social needs take on that same ferocity of instinct. I must have this or I will die. You know, I must, I must take first place in this race or I'm nothing. I must get that promotion. I must, I must succeed. I must have that spouse or my life will be meaningless. You know, that girlfriend, she must fall in love with me and marry me. And then, and then it, it takes on a whole downward spiral of, of pulling um, the higher levels of, of human consciousness into the, sort of into the animal basic instinct of uh, fight, flight, freeze, or sleep. And, and it just, it, it's just, so it's a downward spiral rather than a virtuous spiral. So the the discipline helps us to go from a downward spiral, a vicious cycle, into a virtuous cycle of growth, where things, instead of becoming narrower, narrower, narrow as it goes down the drain, spirals upward. It becomes wider and more inclusive and, and greater amounts of love and greater amounts of harmony, greater amounts of fellowship, where we, we instead of just being, instead of just feeling my own pain, I now feel your pain when you're going through loss. You know, I can, I can grieve with Kathy. So my false self is threatened by Lynn, her first husband, because he was such an awesome guy, you know. So how do, you, how do you compete with that? Well, you don't compete with that. You just be the most awesome guy you can be. But, <laughs> but I, can, I, can, I can feel her loss, and I can feel the loss of my, my stepkids uh, for their dad, right? And that I'm not, I can't ever replace that. But I have a role, a different role in their lives, and I can step into that. Uh, we won't go a lot into the false self with, the, with these things. Uh, we do that other places. We'll hit on that in other classes and stuff. But as we, 
as we read, as we look at what is God inviting me into in this moment, right? So, yeah, sometimes we just need a slap alongside the head, but that's, you know, my kids, that's not my favorite thing. I don't want to be jerk. You don't want to be jerking people's chains and slapping them up and saying, well, yeah, it's time for a come to Jesus meeting, you know? That's, that's just going to cause the false self to respond and, and go into magician mode, to go into Pharisee mode, you know? Um, but we pay attention. How is my false self responding, right? When, when, I, when I'm coming under dis, when I'm coming under a situation, whether it's from the Lord, whether it's from the world or from the devil, whatever, it doesn't matter in one sense. What matters is how I face it, how I walk through it with God. And re, so it's sort of like Joseph when uh, he's thrown into the pit, his, you know, his brothers sell him into slavery, and then he gets thrown into Egypt, and then that whole story it doesn't matter that they intended it for evil. God will turn it and intend it for good. And God does that with everything in our lives. So every, whether, whether we think it's directly from God's hand or directly from the devil's hand or from the world's hand or my own bad choices, God, the same process is in all of it. God meets us in it, in the pain of it. He suffers the pain of it with us. And he walks us into greater maturity, into recognizing our belovedness, into really the kingdom, the sense where, where heaven and earth become one, where even, even when that, like that great cloud of witnesses that was preceding our verse for today, that were, you know, they, the prophets were sawn into, they walked about in sheep's clothing, they were, you know, people trying to starve and kill them. Jesus was on the cross, Right? regardless of, was this God? Is this the world? God is doing an immensely powerful, deep work in that hurt, in that loss. And so as we lean into him, as we lean into going through it with him, love reveals. Love reveals what's in our heart. Love reveals what's in God's heart, his heart for us. Love reveals our false self. It reveals our idolatries. It reveals our need for power and security and esteem and affection and control. All of that. Love reveals all of that. And God meets us in it. Not, not to have a heavy hand with us, but to breathe his blood to flow through us, his spirit to flow through us, to allow ourselves to grow into the fullness of the stature of Christ. And there's, there's, a, there's a lot of steps. Not only steps is probably the wrong word. There's a lot of growth between here and there. Uh, and the Lord will complete what he started in all of us, in all creation. Okay. So, in, um, when we do scripture in sacred space, and uh, we do what we call Lexio Divina, and um, that is where we, we take a scripture, first time, we read it through three or four times. Usually as a group, we have only time for three, uh, and you can do this on your own, you can do this with a group. The first time, you just read the scripture. What's the story about? What's, what's the big bones of the story? But pay particular attention to what do I notice? Not what do I think is the most important thing to notice in the story, but what kind of seems to highlight? What is... What seems to sort of like it's almost shimmers or the Lord has put a highlight on it for me for this particular moment. Um, and then we'll share that. Just in that first time is just to notice that. And we're going to do that here this morning. Uh, and then, we're, and then um, we'll read it through a second time and usually we'd follow that by five to seven minutes of silence. We won't do that this morning. Um, and then we reflect on it. What's the meaning of this passage? What does this passage say about God? What is God like? What is he up to, Right? What's, what's kind of the big story, and what's, what's, the, what's the little story within the big story? How is God behaving right now? What is he doing? Is he judge? Is he, is he smiting? Is he, is he restoring? Is he healing? You know, what, what, what's my view of what God's up to? What are God's motives? <laughs> and, then, um, and then we, ref, we reflect on that, um, and, then, and then we'll read it through again, and then we'll respond, Lord, and we're paying attention to What's your invitation to me? Not for everybody, to me personally, right now in this moment. What are you inviting me to step into with you? 
and then we respond to that. And we pay attention to our response. Now that response might be the false self saying, yeah, I, I, gotta, I gotta kick it in gear, you know, or God's gonna get me. That's, that's really helpful to know because we don't wanna be operating from that, but we wanna, we wanna recognize that what's in us. Um, and also, what's the, what's, the, the, what's the invitation to the true self that says, oh, search me, O oh Lord. Show me, show me where I'm wrong. Heal me. I need healing here. I need growth here. I, I welcome you to search me because I know you're for my good. That's the re- response of the true self. So we, we pay attention to those things. And then, and then we just sort of set our thinking about the word, our thinking in, in being aware of our thinking, being aware of our emotional responses. And then we, we rest and we move deeper beyond our, beyond our thoughts, beyond our feelings, and we try to sink into the heart. And this is a different concept because usually in English language, heart, when we're talking about heart, in the, in the modern vernacular, we mean feelings. But in the, in the ancient mindset, when they used heart, it was something deeper. So the mind was thoughts and feelings. The heart was this, this deeper gravitas of presence. Right, where the spirit is with my spirit, where we go into that inner sanctuary. We go into the garden of the Lord with him. We're at the communion table with him. And where the spirit is revealing things within our spirit that maybe our minds not, are not even clued into yet. And that's, that's sort of the goal of that place of rest. And then that, that bubbles up in all kinds of ways of, of our thinking and of our feelings of sort of rewiring our minds, putting on the mind of Christ and just wonderful things happen from that place. So that's, that's the process of Lexio. And when we did this, well, we're not going to get there yet. Um, so we're going, to read, we're going to read our verse for today, which is Hebrews 1 to 13. Um, and this, I have it printed out somewhere. There we go. So let's invite you to close your eyes. Get comfortable. Don't strain. Don't try to come up with something. No pressure. If nothing particular stands out, that's fine too. Uh, the most important thing in prayer is that we show up. <laughs> we, don't, we don't grade ourselves. So go ahead and close your eyes. So Lord, we, we pray that um, you, we would be sensitive to what your spirit is saying. As we hush our hearts to listen. As we set aside our, our thoughts uh, that, uh, and feelings about you. Lord, just allow you to play with our imagination, walk through our feelings, blow on those strings. Speak to us, Lord, through your word. So this, this first time, just, we're only going to take, we're going to take about 30 seconds of silence after I read this. So just pay attention to what you notice uh, from Hebrews 12, 1 to 13. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. 
but he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees, and make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. About 30 seconds. What in that, what word or phrase or thought seemed to be highlighted for you? What were you drawn to? And I just invite you to speak out that word or phrase. Make note of it to yourself. But I'd invite a few of you, if you would like, to, to speak it out. If anything, that, seem, that you seem drawn to. Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith. Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Unpleasant for a time, but. The joy set before us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. To make straight paths. To make straight paths. Laying aside every weight. Freedom in dis uh, discipline to freedom in Christ. Discipline, discipline to freedom in Christ. Yeah. Welcome in mercy. Welcome in mercy. Mercy. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, the next slide is was kind of highlighted. This is from our sacred space. Just some of the things that came up. Some of the same things. Looking to Jesus, considering Him. Disciplines the one He loves. It's an odd phrase, uh, struck, the peaceful fruit of righteousness. I'd, I'd never really sort of viewed righteous, uh, peace as a, as a fruit of righteousness. Uh, what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather healed. So these, this, there are a number of us, and, and each time we do it, we, can, we might notice something else the next time. But when we read it, when the Lord speaks, he's, he's not just speaking in general, to people in general. He's, he's speaking to us individually for right now, right? Now, we're, we're, we're living with the Lord now, not just off in the future somewhere, but now is our communion with him. So we pay attention. Why, why, noticing, why was I drawn to this phrase? What was the tone and texture of that phrase? Uh, Dallas Willard talks about just the, the importance of paying attention to the tone and texture of what we perceive to be the voice of the Spirit. Is it is it healing? And even when it's convicting, is it convicting to heal? Sort of that you're walking with a limp, you're, you're lame, and if you keep walking that way, it's that hit, you're going to just totally destroy your hip. I want to I correct it so that you're actually on the, on the road to healing, not to, not to lameness, not to making a bad situation worse. You know, what, it, what is the tone and texture of the Lord's voice when he comes to you? And if, it, if it's sort of more of a fleshly, pharisaical, condemning, it's like, yeah, I don't think that's so much, that doesn't sound like Jesus. And it, Jesus sounds, the Father sounds like Jesus. I should say Jesus sounds like the Father. So if it doesn't sound like Jesus, it's not the Father either. Uh, so we pay attention to that tone and texture. And sometimes if we had a very uh, religious upbringing, we'll notice that, oh, that voice is taking on that tone and texture of that critical religious spirit that I was raised in. And it's like, yeah, I shouldn't be paying attention to that, you know. And so that's, that's where he's, the Lord is helping to deliver us from those false self religious systems of the pharisaical school we might have been brought up in.
So the story I'm telling myself about God, what is that? Right? As I come to a scripture, what is the story? I'm, who is God in this scripture? What is, what is God like? What is his motivations? This, to, to go back to the garden, does he really have my best interest in mind? And if the, if the voice I'm hearing inside me is saying, no, he doesn't. Uh, he's just, God has his own plans that have really, you're just, you're just a cog in the machine and you don't really matter to him. He's just all about holiness and he's going to smite you or torture you or punish you or, in a sense, discipline in a very negative sense uh, until you get in line. Then we're telling ourselves a, a, a lie about God. We've, we've bought into a lie, into a system that's really going to destroy our soul and cause us to flee from him, to run from him, to flee into outer darkness rather than to turn and see that in his eyes, when he looks at me, even in my worst moments, it's one of compassion and restoration and healing. It's one of anger against the things that are holding me captive, just as if I have a child lying in a hospital bed and just covered with sores and that's disfiguring my child. My heart is moved with compassion for the child, but I am 100% set against the disease that is crippling my child and disfiguring them from the life that I want them to be able to enjoy and flourish in. And that is, that is God's heart toward us. When God looks at my false self, he's not condemning me for it. He's saying, yeah, John, that the natural self has been bought into this whole corrupt world system of trying to live life apart from me. And that part of you has to die so that you can experience the joy and freedom of being my beloved son. So that the, the, the works I desire to, I have prepared for you to walk in and desire to do through you, you can, you can step into them with me and we can, we can learn to do them together. I enjoy doing them together. I mean, the Lord he could get along perfectly fine without us, but this, this parental love desires to draw us into his business. And Jesus says, I need to be about my father's business. I do, I do what I see the father doing. I speak what I hear the father say. And that is the model, not just the model for all of us. We are actually stepping into the fullness of Jesus' sonship as his body, as his resurrected body, that he's poured out his spirit within us. This is the life he's inviting us into. And we're all on that maturing, transforming, transcending uh, journey with him. Yeah, so we, we talked about paying attention when, the, when it doesn't sound like God. That's the false self. It's just like, just, you don't have to chastise yourself for it. Don't beat yourself up for it. Just recognizing, yeah, this dynamic's going on. And I'm not going to be manipulated by it. Thank you, but I'm going to pass on that dish. We don't argue with the false self. Arguing with the false self is like arguing with a two-year-old. You, you're smarter, you know better, but you're not going to win. You're, you're not going to win that drawn into an argument. It's so, so for the false self, and we don't try to reason. It's like trying to reason with someone who's gaslighting and manipulating and just wants to control us. They're not interested in reason. They're just interested in, in control and manipulation. But we speak the truth of the situation, speak the truth of that word, and let it, and let it sit. Let the, let the truth do its work. We don't have to argue them into the truth. So it's like when Jesus rebuked, you know, during his temptation, he rebukes the devil. He speaks the word. But he doesn't get drawn into a, a long argument. You speak the word to the situation, maybe just to the spiritual environment at large. I, I speak that truth to my soul, to reground my soul in the, the true nature of God, in the true love of God. Uh, and I let go of my need to control and fix the situation. I let go of the need to create myself, to mature myself. I let, I let go of that, that need to fulfill God's work in me, and I just embrace the moment as it is with the Lord. He's with me. So I, I turn my attention to his presence and my awareness of his presence to do all the, the things that need doing. Because there's, there's, there's a lot of stuff. 
But the one task I have is to look to him, to look to Jesus, not just as an example, but his presence in me, with me, operating through me. And that's why the importance of going to that place of rest, to get in tune with the breath of the Spirit within me, the love of the Spirit within me. And all these other things will take care of themselves. So in the, go ahead and leave the slide up. In, in this verse, the word for chastise, you know, the Lord disciplines the one he loves. Uh, he chastises his son. The word for chastise was uh, pedusis in Greek. And there, it's, it's, it's actually off of the original of to bring up a child. Chastising is bringing up a child. To discipline or correct. Uh, it's not synonymous with punish at all. Because it, it always has the best interest of bringing the child to maturity and completion, to amend their behavior. Um, when I was in fifth grade, I was playing backyard football. I had to be home for dinner, and the game was really good. And I knew I was going to be a little bit late, so I took my watch, and I set it back 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah, I didn't fool mom. <laughs> Kind of nip that in the bud. Yeah, don't, don't, don't cheat on the truth. Uh, I got grounded. Uh, I gr- grounded a lot growing up. Uh, when I got my license, I took the car over to my friend's house. Normally, I'd have just rode my bike or walked. It was less than, less than a mile. But I didn't tell her where I was going. It wasn't that I took the car. It's just I didn't tell her where I was going. So I got grounded from the car for two weeks. So that chastisement was like, you're just, you can't just be about yourself, John. You're, you're accountable to your parents. Um, that as we grow older, that so chastising one sense, right? It roots out that stubbornness, that foolishness of a child. It roots out that I can take shortcuts and and come out okay. And it's like, nah, you're gonna get busted. Don't even, don't even don't even go there with the lying bit and trying to deceive. But then there's the there's the chastising that comes from raising up. So as a as a coach. Uh, our mile relay team, we ran a fart lick. So you'd, you'd run 110, sprint 110, walk 110, sprint a 220, walk 110, sprint a 330, and then walk 110 and just keep doing that. And we'd have different people lead out each time. So you always had a rabbit to chase full tilt. Uh, and then they might hang toward the back of the pack on the next run, but y'all had somebody fresh to, to push us. Well, we won, we won the state championship in the mile relay. That had been, we had just, you know, and by the end of all that, I had just a phenomenal kick coming at 3.30 where the gorilla jumps on your back. I just, I found on that relay, I would always find another gear. Well, that's because that training was, had, had trained us to push past the lactic acid burn and dig, dig deeper and, and find that other gear, right? So that, um, that, that training served us well. But what that training didn't serve me well was my, my default thing in life now became, I can take the pain. I can take it and find another gear, right? So when I'm in a relationship uh, in my first marriage and I'm being hurt, it's like, oh, I can take that pain. I don't need to acknowledge it. I'll just dig deep. I'll find that other gear. This is, you know, and, and I, I won't fix the problem. I'll just, I'll just suffer through it. And so it didn't, it didn't, pre- it prepared me well to be a runner. It didn't prepare me well to deal with relationships and disappointments and, and being honest about my needs, right? So those, those are where earlier levels of growth can serve us at one level, but in the, in the relational level, they don't serve us well at all. In some degree, it's, it's, it's good to be able to take pain and so that you can calmly address things, find out what you need. The story I'm telling myself is you don't love me. It's like, well, no, I, you know, uh, in saying, well, why do you feel that way? Well, I feel that way because of this and that. And you kind of walk through it and negotiate things and all the, all the good things that healthy relationships would do. But those are all things that have to be learned. Well, in chastisement, there's so much of our growing up that we're just, we learn through osmosis from our parents, from people, from mentors at work who not only do their job with excellence, but hopefully take time to mentor us 
to transfer that excellence to us, whether you're a carpenter or an electrician or a plumber or an engineer or a doctor or a lawyer uh, or a business person, that there's, there's people mentoring you because uh, they value what they have and they value people who value it. And so we learned, we learned to ask for help. Say, hey, could you help me grow in this? Uh, you, you seem to have it really together in this area in life. Would you, would you, help, would you help teach me? I want to learn from you, right? This is, this is a form of discipline um, that goes beyond childhood and, and on into our mature adulthood. So a lot of people they want to give you is just self-discipline. And self-discipline will serve you really well in the world to get those goals. Self-discipline won't give you wisdom about which goals are worth going after. I think it was Stephen, Coven, Coven, Stephen Covey, you know, he said, we, we, we learned to climb the ladder of success only to realize it was on the wrong wall the whole time, you know, so to get to the end of your life. And does God really wait for us to get to the end of our life to say, sorry, dude, yeah, you, 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 you got up there in record time, but it was the wrong wall. Um, when I was training as, as a manager, you know, they said during your annual reviews, there shouldn't be any surprises that you're, you're unleashing on your employee. Well, I've been waiting to tell you this, but you've really been screwing up all year long, you know. No, it's like you, this is a time to praise them. You should be keeping short accounts throughout the year that they come away from, they come away from that um, annual review feeling really good and connected. Ah, uh, I had an annual review with, with one of my coworkers who reported to me. And, and so I was just really heaping a lot of praise on him during that review of, of all the things he was doing really well that I was proud of. And then I left the office and I came back. It was a couple minutes later. I was just going to ask him a question. He's there with tears in his eyes. Just his, his soul was touched. I mean, and when I was going through cancer and I had like, I had about four hours of energy every day and working half days, but he, he really saved my job. He saved my bacon because I, I didn't have it in me to keep doing my job well. I really leaned on him, and he, he gladly just stepped up and, and carried me through that. You know, he had my back. Um, yeah, anyway, thank you, Doug. <laughs> so... In everything, what, what is the Lord inviting me to for my good? What is this revealing about God, the nature of God, what I really believe about God? So much of what passes for discipleship, Dallas Willard would say, is professing the right things, whether we believe them or not. <laughs> so we get out of touch with what do I really think about God? Where, where has God really become too small in my eyes? Where has become too small in my heart? Where, has, where have I taken the character of God and really turned him into a Pharisee, uh, a judgmental, self-righteous personality who's going around zapping people who displease him um, rather than this, this, this soul healer, this world healer, this savior of the world, not the, not the destroyer of it. Um, one who chases us into the outer darkness and walks beside us until we turn and recognize his presence. And he, and he weeps with us and he invites us back in. And yes, there is, there is the whole purify, God is a purifying, consuming fire, consuming all, of the, all that is false within us, not because he needs it to suffer, but he needs to set us free from it. His, his whole mission is one of rescue and compassion and restoration and bringing to fulfillment his desires for all creation. That's, that's the deeper story. That's the gospel. Um, Jesus is saving the world. God is saving the world. God is salvation. So we're going to read this. Uh, golly. You're going to read the scripture one more time. Um. And this time I want, to, I want you to, what's the Lord's personal invitation to you, not for somebody else, not the people in general, 
for you today. What's the Lord inviting you into? You're welcome to read with your eyes open uh, or just listen, either one. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which we have all participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems rather painful than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees. And make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather healed. Take a minute, and I mean a full minute, in silence. What's the Lord inviting you to step into? What is the response rising up in you? What was the tone and texture of that invitation? Did it sound like the Lord who gave himself up for you? Or did it sound more like someone who just, no matter how much you do, raises the bar to increase uh, what it needs to meet expectation? And if, if it felt like the latter, that's okay. Invite that. Invite that part of you to the table. Come, come and see the larger picture of the heart of God. And if it's the part of you that's ready to embrace the larger picture of the heart of God, the true self, come with that also. Jesus on the cross, we read, um, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in this scripture, we read 
he was enduring that which the sinners were unleashing upon this righteous man. I think it was Plato who said, if there was ever a truly righteous man among us, we would crucify him. This was about 300 years before the birth of Christ. That, that one of the world's greatest philosophers recognizes that there is something about the human, the fallen, the captive human nature that wants no part of righteousness. And yet, without holiness, we cannot see God. Seeing God is not a reward for holiness. It's actually the eyes through which we see of holiness. An upright spirit, this this is the wavelength of light <laughs> in which we see God. Uh, communion with God is not a reward for doing the right things. A heart trained in righteousness is one that perceives the heartbeat of God and beats in time with it. It, it hears the music of God, is empowered by God. This, this isn't a pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Um, this is really take up your cross and, and die to that which is not in tune with that. Not as punishment, but because Jesus doesn't know Mises. <laughs> Mises has no part of Jesus. And the natural self of me that has been captive in a false self system, that, that whole system needs to die so that the natural man can be filled with the fullness of the spiritual man and truly know home for the first time, to truly know the life and worship and communion that Christ has with the Father and by the Spirit is sharing with us. So Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, he gave thanks. Father, I thank you for this bread. We thank you for the food we have. We thank you for the provision you've provided for us, for our daily sustenance. I thank you for my work. I thank you for my family. I thank you for my relationships, Lord. I receive them from you, Lord, and I, I offer them back to you. I don't want to pursue them independently of you, Lord, but I want to partake in them in, with, and through you. This is my blood poured out in the new covenant. Shed for the remission of sin. Not as a thing to be punished, but a thing to remove far from you. To root every shred where those barbs have entered into your soul and hold you captive and cause you pain whenever you when you try to pursue and cherish the things of God. The Lord is inviting us into his life so we can die to the old nature and be resurrected into his. The Lord is holy for us. He has fully entered into our condition and he is healing us from the inside out by the presence of his spirit. The brown cups are wine, the blue cups are juice, they're both his blood, beating in us, through us, connecting us one with another, until we are all made one in him, fully perfected in Christ. And in this hope, we are saved. Not that our hope rises up to save us, but the hope comes from the faith of Christ, poured out, consumed by us. He is the living bread. He is, he is the living water. His blood flows through us, connecting us, making us one body in him. So after you come, rest. Rest in the love and presence of the Lord. Not with some to-do list to step up to, but just rest in his love and let him restore your soul. So Lord, 
we receive the word of your spirit. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Not because you have weighed me and found me worthy, Lord, but you have reached out and grafted us into the very personhood of your son, Jesus. So I do not stand here alone. I stand here with Christ united in me, Christ united in all of us. You are drawing the whole world to yourself. You are rescuing the whole world until every knee gladly confesses that Jesus is Lord. Till every heart opens wide to your love and is transformed from the inside out. Believe the gospel. Receive the love that the Father has for you in this moment and every moment. In Jesus' name, amen.